Hi, everyone. I'm Leah Gallant. I'm the program curator at the Goethe Institute Chicago. I'm actually from Cambridge, Massachusetts. So hello, everyone from Boston. Um, and just to echo what Annette said, I'm really excited to be co-presenting this program. So I'm just going to introduce um, our speakers, and then I'll pass it over to Dana. So Valerie Olivero is an artist based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and originally from Singapore. Currently, the resident photographer at the Cranert Center for the Performing Arts. She was a freelance production manager and stage manager for 14 years. Um, and she also has an MFA from the Yale School of Drama in Stage Management. She has worked with international artists in performing arts venues and festivals, and her photos have appeared in the New York Times, American Theater Magazine, and Time Out. She's interested in spaces and landscapes that are in transition, in human use, intervention, strategies of landscape and space, as well as natural human tension in landscapes and space. And next, I'd like to introduce Annie Javian, uh, a movement artist and educator whose research is rooted in her ideas about humans as storytellers, story holders, and story makers. Through choreography, interdisciplinary collaboration, and improvisation, her work excavates and unearths our unique histories. She's most recently presented her choreography in Yerevan, Paris, and New York City, and performed with Joanna Kotze, Betsy Miller, and Paige Phillips. Annie is an assistant professor of dance at Rutgers University, and she is a member of the American College Dance Association's Board of Directors. And lastly, Dana Kasperson as a conflict engagement specialist, award-winning performing artist and author. Her book, Changing the Conversation, The 17 Principles of Conflict Resolution has been translated into eight languages and is widely used as a training tool by organizations, schools and individuals worldwide. In her work, integrating conflict engagement strategies with choreographic methodologies she has designed and realized teaching and communication methods and large-scale public dialogue models, bringing together thousands of people from diverse communities around the world. As a leading collaborator of choreographer William Forsyth for over 30 years, Kasperson has co-created and performed across the world as a principal artist with the Ballet Frankfurt and the Forsyth Company. Dana has received the Bessie Award for Outstanding Creative Achievement in the United States and was also nominated for the Laurence Olivier Award for Outstanding Achievement in England. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Dana. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. It's such a pleasure to see you all. Thank you, Aneta and Leah and the Goethe Institutes of Boston and Chicago for hosting this and also for supporting the disagreement project in general. Um, and thank you to Al, to Val and Ani for being here today. Um, I'm gonna take a second and turn myself off here so I'm not the main picture. <laughs> Um, yes, Val and Ani were wonderful collaborators on this project, so it's great that they could join us today. So before we get started, if everybody could just grab a pencil or pen and um, be prepared to be able to get into gallery view. Uh, later on, to get to gallery view, you go to the upper right hand corner, click view and click gallery. You can be wherever you want right now, but eventually we'll get there. And if you could keep yourself on mute for the time being, that'd be great. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about my work at the intersection of conflict engagement and dance thinking and some of the public action projects that I've been developing with different groups over the years. And we're going to actually try out some of the models as well, including the disagreement project. Um, and then later on, when we get to the disagreement project, Val and Ani will also share about their experience on that project. So I've worked as a performer and a creator in dance for 45 years. And for the last 15 years, I've been studying and working in the field of conflict. 
and I work with individuals, with groups, with communities. And my main interest is in helping people increase their own capacity to step into these difficult conversations, these difficult situations of conflict productively. So I work as a coach, as a teacher, as a mediator, as a advisor, as a writer, and then in the design of these participatory events training models and public action models that do happen at this intersection of conflict engagement and choreographic thinking. So when I'm saying participatory event, what I mean by that is any situation where people are interacting. So it could be a dinner party, a, a voting system, a performance, it could be walking into a bank. My overall interest in all of this work is to get a better understanding and maybe start to think about what we can actually do to concretely reduce the levels of violence in the world. It's a big goal, but that's actually what, what I care about. Um, so we're always in the practices of choreographic thinking and conflict engagement. I see that there's a similar practice happening, which is that we're always crafting environments and actions and structures to try to enable certain things and prevent certain things. So to make certain experiences and outcomes more or less likely. And as I think about these things, there's two things that I often focus on, which is what are we paying attention to? And what are the categories of decision making that we're engaging with? So we're always already shaping our environments and the interactions through the decisions that we make. And this matrix of all these interconnected decisions is always present, it's always in motion, and many decisions are unconscious or they're inherited. So I find that it's building our capacity to recognize the categories and to be able to focus our attention consciously that is a really powerful practice to build. So that's part of what I'm interested in doing in these projects that I've been working on. So in conflict and in participatory event creation, decisions are always happening on multiple levels. So they're on the level of the overall event. For example, who's there? How did they get there? How are the space and the time structured? on the level of interpersonal actions and, and structures of interaction. So what kinds of interactions are proposed or supported or prevented? How are those actions shaped by physical configuration, the methods of communication, and then the decisions that impact our interior actions. So how we're focusing our attention. How do we use motion, form? How do we use the body as a location of reflection? So noticing that our body's always sensing and that we can practice accessing the body's constant, lively attention. We can use physical sensation as a tool of awareness for examining and experiencing things more deeply. That's, that's how I see this work. And so as an overall frame that we can use today to think about how we shape environments and situations, I propose that we think of choreographic thinking as encompassing physical action. So what we do with our bodies internal reflection through bodily sensation, how we use the body to help us notice what's happening, the organization of bodies and space, objects and the space itself, which also includes things like how are people invited into situations? What's the relationship of the event to the social environment, etc. And then the, that decisions are always, always also taking place on the level of the single body, between bodies, between the body and space, and on space itself. So as we go along, we're going to try out some extracts from these models, and I'll invite us to consider together what is the experience that people are having and which choreographic decisions have impacted that experience. Um, if you have a burning question as we go along, just kind of let me know. Um, I'm going to give you a little picture here of what I mean by choreographic decision categories. Um, so for example, whoops. We go back there. These are just a few categories within which uh, choreographic thinkers are always making decisions. And in my experience, any situation that's participatory, we're also making these decisions. So these are just a few short, you know, out of obviously a much longer list. And again, these things are happening in across fields, across actions. I think of them as choreographic because that's my background. So time, when is it happening? How long is it? How is time divided? space, location, the characteristics of space, form, how do we use physical shape, what does that mean, motion, the role of choice, how we use choice, social norms, the role of witnesses, are there witnesses, emotion, spatial organization. So these kind of categories 
are ones within which we're always making decisions. And these are some other considerations that I always think of when I'm working on a new project. What's the experience that I would hope people to have? What am I trying to prevent? What am I trying to enable? For example, I might be trying to prevent a kind of habitual argument and I might be trying to enable a conversation that really gets at what people care about. What's the purpose? Is it informative, exchange, debate, reflection? For example, the disagreement project was not about debate, but it was about exchange and reflection. And then which decisions are there to be made? Which are mine? Which are the participants? So I'm gonna just show you a couple of projects here and we'll try something out. This is the exchange, which um, I developed with the Michael Douglas Collective in Germany. And we've done it in Germany, in Slovakia, Italy, Turkey, Romania, and Sweden. And the project is focused on violence, in particular, large scale violence and how our own experiences are connected to and impacted by violence, how we impact the levels of violence. So in the project, the people you can see here in the larger view are dividing into three groups, which then rotate through various stations. In the middle of the space, you see the people who are um, responding to questions with simple physical gestures. They're looking at the statements on the wall. The people walking around them are having conversations in pairs, and then there's people sitting on either end of this room who are listening. So here's the people in the center. They walk in from the side, um, gather into little groups, answer a few questions, and then move back out. So the people in the center are answering questions like this. My, my understanding of violence is similar to that of my parents. People listening are hearing small fragments of stories. And so this um, project, everybody moves through all the sections and the people in the middle are put quite in a kind of a tense position because they're answering in public. So they have to decide whether they're telling the truth, whether they're standing where they really do. The people walking around them are very relaxed typically. And the people from the side are in a state of observation. So let's, um, let's actually try this one. So I'm gonna invite you to turn on your cameras if you don't mind. And we're going to um, do the center piece. Okay, so this will be like this. This would be yes, no, maybe, I don't know. So let's just rehearse that for a second. Ready? Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. And if you don't want to answer, you can just put your hands behind your back. All right. Okay, so I'm going to say a statement and then please respond in the way that makes sense to you. Violence is part of human nature. Okay. Violence is learned behavior. Okay. My beliefs about violence are similar to those of my parents. I know someone who has experienced violence. I know someone who has engaged in violence. Hmm. Violence is a form of justice in certain circumstances. Hmm. Playing with toy guns teaches children to be violent. Hmm. It is acceptable for schools to use violence to, as a punishment for students. It is acceptable for parents or guardians to use violence as punishment for children. The government should be able to use violence to enforce the law in certain circumstances. The death penalty is a form of violence. The death penalty is acceptable.
It is acceptable for soldiers to kill other soldiers in a war situation. It is acceptable for soldiers to kill civilians in a war situation. Police should carry guns. People should be able to, citizens should be able to carry registered guns in public. I would never use violence. I think it is possible to substantially reduce the amount of international violence in the world. I think it's possible to substantially reduce the amount of interpersonal violence in the world. Okay. Okay, great. So as you were doing that, if you were in the project, you'd be in the center, you'd be surrounded by people walking and then people sitting on the side listening. So now I'd like to invite you into the listening section. If you can just sit comfortably so you can hear me, you don't have to see me for this. And here we're using the body as a place of reflection, okay? All right, so imagine you're in the space, you're looking out at the space. Welcome. In a moment, you will hear a description of a series of situations where you're invited to imagine yourself as a number of different people. Please notice what it feels like to be these people in these situations. The people and the activities happening in the room where you're sitting now may be part of what you imagine or remember, or they may not, it's up to you. We will be discussing, violence will be cropping up. So if you prefer not to be involved, go ahead and take yourself out and I'll call you back. Okay, please close your eyes. When you open your eyes, you will be walking down the street beside your friend two weeks before an invasion. Please open your eyes. Your friend is telling you that she's just received news that she's been accepted into the university. Her face is bright. She says that she's waiting until tonight to tell her husband to surprise him. You decide to go to a nearby cafe to celebrate. You and your friend are excited and laughing as you talk about next year. As you turn the corner, the wind blows dust in your eyes. Please close your eyes. When you open your eyes, two weeks have gone by. Please open your eyes. Please close your eyes. When you open your eyes, you will be looking at a person whose country is at war with your own. Please open your eyes. And now the scene changes and you're in a group of people who look up at the stars at night. And now the scene changes again and you're in a room full of refugees. Your child is not there. What is the sound of the situation? Please close your eyes and take a deep breath. You are the pilot of a long range stealth bomber and the aircraft that you're flying is carrying several bombs. Please open your eyes. As you approach the edge of the city that is your target, your heart starts to beat faster. You check your instruments and wait for the moment to release the bombs. Please close your eyes. When you open your eyes, you will be in a society that forbids murder and allows war. Please open your eyes. And then the scene changes and you're in a society that allows both murder and war. Please close your eyes. 
When you open your eyes, you will be in a room full of people who are capable of building peace. Please open your eyes. Where do you place yourself in that situation? Please close your eyes. Please open your eyes. Okay, thank you. So those are two of the parts of that project and I wanna just quickly check in and ask what people's experience was in those. Anybody, just throw out a thought. What was your experience either in the hands or in the listening? I think the listening was um, too fast. Mm -hmm. And that could be because um, I actively work on informing people uh, about Iranian issues and causes. So that kind of triggered something where I would have to slow down mm -hmm. to really be able to immerse myself. The jump was quite fast from imagining yourself being in a country where uh, you're at war with another country to imagining myself being um, about to release a bomb. Mm -hmm. That was almost manipulative to me. Okay. But the this, the nonverbal and sort of the flow and the way I think the dramaturgy of the categories presented Hmm. worked really well because I was able to release ideas um, in a both like in an embodied way, but then pay attention to how my nonverbal release was maybe reflected or not or on the spectrum with others, which helped me at the same time kind of interrogate the decision making. Hmm. So it was a difference between a narrative that didn't rely so much on a imaginative, fictional, almost fantastical um, flow to a actual like more concrete, but yet at the same time abstract flow where I had more agency, I think. Thank you. Yeah. And so you bring up the questions around decisions around time. So here I, I did compress it also. It was shorter. So it felt too fast and then it it can very quickly feel manipulative so that is that is something that is always a struggle of like what's the right timing for the space that you're in um and then the 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 visibility you brought into the question of what is what is available to me so when people were available in their answers that also gave you more of a sense of community and and agency yeah john i saw you raise your hand there yes dana uh it challenge me just thinking of I want to be a good person a nice person and some of the questions and the answers are maybe depending on where you are in your context maybe if you approve of killing in certain circumstances or something does this make you less of a a nice person um regardless how we might be if we were confronted with the situation i'm working with ukrainian refugees at the moment and uh one of the women in the workshop i'm doing started sobbing her husband had been killed a couple of days earlier and um i suppose we're all on the side of ukraine and the war at the moment but the the reality of that is guns bombs and killing other people uh be it in self-defense and um it would have been so easy without this inconvenience of the war to have a, a wider moral judgment I just feel um yeah I don't know how to answer without sounding in some way slightly extreme or like a potential NRA sympathizer or something yeah so it brings up the complexities of these questions and it and it also creates this moment where you're like hey actually I have more detail I'd like to offer around my my beliefs in this yeah hmm. And so what, what the project does is it, it creates that tension a little bit through that tension of being in the middle. Of, am I going to do this publicly? Am I actually saying what I want? And it mm. brings up all the topics. And then people have a chance to talk together 
in a very relaxed way. So it's kind of playing a little bit with that tension of those two things. I'm going to jump to the next one just so we um, I saw your hand up, Katarina. Maybe we can catch you a, a little bit. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so. So th this is another project that I did, which is. Um, was actually the, one of the first projects it did called Not a Not in Germany, which is on immigration. It was created at a time when this book came out called Germany Does Away With Itself. So very anti-immigrant, a lot of sentiment at the time and of course still now. Um, so this project uh, took place in various cities around Germany. Here you can see some different communities. Um, and this is a project where the whole group moves as one through two different parts. This is a, the triangle section, which has a similar quality to the hands section in that people are asked to take positions. Here we're making decisions about space. We're dividing a large triangle into three parts and on either side of the triangle is either a monitor or a, or a flip chart and people are asked to move to the side that makes sense to them. So here you can see people talking and trying to decide where to go. And this moves um, from questions about background to questions about um, beliefs, cultural, cultural customs, and then concrete things like, should immigrants be able to vote? So it begins with three statements, which are, my family has a German background, my family does not have a German background, my family has mixed background. So people divide themselves into groups. The next set of statements is, I feel German, I don't feel German, I feel like I belong to multiple communities. And then my experience is that many of the people with the German background leave and go to the I don't feel German. A lot of the immigrant folks move into I feel German, and then there's a lot of motion in the in-between one. So it starts to create, um, as it goes on, a sense, as, and people reconfigure in many different ways, a sense of the borders being much more permeable. And it also does the kind of that same thing that we were just talking about, that um, brings up the topics and makes people want to talk more. So almost invariably, three quarters of the way through the triangle, someone raises, someone says, hey, but I want to talk more about this. And I have to stand in all three places at once. And, and, and so people start laughing. So it brings up again complexity so that when we get to these conversations at the tables, everyone's divided into four tables of four in the room. And there are conversations that are facilitated from the front. So I'm up in the front offering a question. And then we have a simple thing where each person has a certain amount of time to speak around the table if they wish to. And while that's happening, unbeknownst to the people, is the project that I began with um, the Academy for Visual Arts in Frankfurt. The tables are covered in paint and in paper. So as people are talking together and gesturing, they're leaving traces on the tables. And then we make these prints and we write the names of the people that they've offered on the side where they sat. And then these prints are laid out in the space and become uh, the contemplative objects that people walk around and look at because you can see the dynamic of the conversation. You can see the motion, the stillness, um, and it becomes a slight abstraction that allows people to consider their conversation in a new way. So that um, project, and now I'd like to talk about the Polarity Party, which is a project we can try a little bit. Um, the Polarity Party is one that I made also with the Michael Douglas Collective, like The Exchange. This is one that we've done in um, Germany and Italy and Romania. Um, and it uses, again, the body as a place of reflection, and it uses a lot of configuration. And, the, and it, works with the, what, it works with looking at the impact of our internal stories on our experience of other people. So here in the in-person version, you can see these are two concentric circles. There's an inner circle and an outer circle. Um, and this is in the middle of the room. Everybody gets a little book. The people in the inner circle have a little book that says, uh, when you look up at the person opposite you, please imagine that you're in a polarized situation and it's impossible to talk. The person in the outer circle has a little book that says, please imagine you're in a polarized situation with the person, but you found a way to talk and it's okay. And then we invite them to sit without speaking for a minute and imagine that situation. So project that story onto the situation. And then we have them switch books and then we have them switch chairs and do it again because we've discovered that changing the configuration, if you're on the inside, it feels more defensive. If you're on the outside, it feels a little more aggressive. 
So we're playing with this idea that what we hold internally as a story impacts how we experience the other person. And that a lot of our mindset is, um, is malleable, it's changeable, depending on what we choose to pay attention to. So these people in the middle are um, surrounded by people who are walking or, or sitting. They, so they're picking up these questions so they can have conversations. Sometimes they're sitting side by side like this. Sometimes they're moving through the space. Um, and while they're moving, one of the questions they're as, asking is, um, if my polarized situation was a film, what would be the title? And what would be the title of the other person? And then there's also a question, what question does not get asked in the situation? And then those, um, those are going to be projected onto the wall later. And there's one more section, which is the observation section, where there's these little papers that you can you sit down and it offers uh, frameworks for looking at the space. Things like look at it through the frame of tempo, synchronization, separation, contradiction, translation, trust, resistance, history, sense of belonging. And eventually these, um, these titles are projected on the wall in, together with the questions that don't get asked. So here you just see one title from one person. And this is, um, this is a project that we actually ended up doing online as well during the pandemic. So we're gonna try a few of those little parts of uh, what we did online, if that's okay. So I'm gonna ask you to please turn your video back on if you can. And look at the people in your horizontal line. Look at the people in the horizontal line that you're part of. Um, and imagine that you are a group. You are together. Okay, now look at the people either in the line above or below you. And imagine that that's a different group. Now please imagine that your two groups are polarized on the issue of abortion. So the people in the other line believe differently than you. Just notice that dynamic. What happens in your body as you look at that other group? What do you start to assume about them? Okay, now imagine that your groups are not polarized. And now switch your attention again, this might be quick jumps, but if you switch your attention to the vertical line that you're part of, and this is now your group. And you trust the people in your group implicitly. You totally trust them. Okay, so just take a moment and notice what that feels like to really trust those people. Like a big relief. And now imagine, look at the line either to the right or to the left of your line. That's a different group. Please imagine that your group does not trust that other group and that you're in conflict and you can't have a conversation. Doesn't feel safe. Just notice what happens in your body as you consider that. Okay, now imagine that your group and the other group have found a way to have a productive conversation. You might still disagree, but you can see a way forward. And notice what that feels like. Now, if you could bring your attention back to the individuals and let those groups go. All right. So that's one aspect, one way of using the body as a way to imagine. And I'd like to try one more. If you could grab the pen or pencil that you have. And think for a moment, just take a minute and think about a person or a group 
that you feel polarized from or that you feel in conflict with where there's some kind of negative separation between you could be a, could be a person you know could be a political group Just take a few minutes and think of some moments and think. Okay. All right, so if you could imagine, I'll just, you can get yourself comfortable. You can turn away from the screen so you look into your own space. You can, take, you can turn your chair. So if you can have your chair be your space and then pick a place across the room, either another chair or an object to stand in for the person that you feel separated from negatively that you're conflict with or polarized from. So just find a point in the room that sits, stands in for them. Okay. All right, so if you could sit in your chair and put your attention on that other person, on the chair or the object that's standing in for them. Imagine that they are there. And notice how the space between you and them feels. And keeping your attention on that person or that group who you feel polarized from, mentally place a line between you. So think about where the border that marks the two sides of your conflict would be if it was physically on the floor, where would you put a line? And then go ahead and put your pen or your pencil on the floor to mark that line. Okay. So come back to your chair and focus your attention on that borderline and how it affects you. And ask yourself, what is that border intended to prevent or enable? And then if you could move out of your chair and physically approach the border without crossing it and notice how moving closer to it affects you. What happens in your body? Okay, and when you're ready, you shake out your body, come back to your chair. And bring your attention back to the borderline. And while maintaining a sense of appropriate safety, so don't do anything that doesn't feel okay, try mentally moving that border, both in the direction of yourself and in the direction of the other person. This is just an investigation, so don't do anything that feels weird. Just go ahead and try it out and see what happens in you. Notice that the point of this action is investigation. It's not about agreeing or submitting or ignoring boundaries. 
or excusing behavior that is destructive. This is just a way to look at the dynamics of a situation and to notice how we remain inevitably interconnected even when we're really in profound disagreement. Okay, if you could move away from your chair and look at the configuration of your chair and the other person from the outside. So look at the dynamic between the two of you, you and the person or the group from this other angle. And then try wishing the other person or group well. Try wishing them good things, especially if your first impulse is not to wish them well. And then try wishing yourself well. Okay, and when you're ready, come back to your spot. And come back to yourself and just take a deep breath and exhale on your own time. And entertain for a moment the idea that every conflict is proposing constructive change. Okay, and we'll wrap that one up there. So that's a that's a fragment of that type of a model. So I want to check in again with people and uh, what did you notice in yourself in either this borderline practice or in the lines practice. I was fascinated to discover that I was happy that the line could move because when I first had to put down the line, I felt very like I want to protect myself. And then as time went on, I realized when you asked us to like, what does it feel the dynamic to move it forward or back? Um, and some something in that made me very happy that it could be malleable. Um, so it changed my sense of like, sticking to my guns kind of thing like sticking to what I believe in you know so that being an expression that probably isn't the best one to use in this kind of thing but it is an expression in our, in English language sticking to my guns yeah. <laughs> yeah so you're bringing up the this category of so if we look at what were the choreographic decision making that allowed that it was that it, it located the decision internally in you of what kind of imaginary motion you enabled. And then that led you to um, be able to move it in the way that helped you understand something that you wanted to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just checking in with Val says, digging in heels for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else? What was the line? What did you notice in the lines practice there? I noticed a heightened sense of um, ambivalence of the person I'm thinking of. I'm, I'm currently unclear about how, what type of boundary I want to have. And I became all the more aware of how um, unclear that answer is. Uh, it, it was nice to play with that distance of the boundary, but um, uh, I was acutely aware of how difficult it would it is to navigate that boundary and to find a clear answer to some to, to that boundary sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that brings up something that the body does really well, which is by giving it a body and giving it a space, sometimes it's easier to notice 
how unclear things are or to notice the tensions that are internal. And I find that giving that abstraction that can either be in the body or by putting in space often helps people consider questions they hadn't considered really carefully before and to notice the complexity. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on either of those, the either the line one? Yeah, Katarina. Uh, hello. With the lines of the groups, there was this tiny sensation of the, the nervous system uh, co-regulating with the people we can trust or starting to dysregulate with the other people we cannot trust. So there was there was already this felt sense of between co-regulation and dysregulation. And it was very interesting to feel that in the body. Thank yeah, you. I find that also really extraordinary how powerful our internal mindset is to the way that our body is regulating itself. And that can be really useful to, to know and be aware of in conflict. And it can be useful yes. in creating events as a way to either help people kind of settle or to provoke a kind of useful um, kind of extra awareness of like, wait a minute, I need to look again at what I'm thinking here. Yeah. Yeah, it was very interesting this, what you said about feeling safe or not feeling safe. So just that, just being very aware of when and where we can feel uh, more safe or less safe already, already gives this awareness of where we put the boundary or, or either a, a physical boundary or, or how we can soothe our bodies also a little bit. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I see someone just wrote here, choosing a political group and how, yeah, and it's interesting to notice. So one of the questions we didn't get to in there is looking at reluctance to move the line and asking what that reluctance is doing, what's it enabling or preventing. Um, so along all of these things, that question of what's, what is something trying to prevent or enable that I've hung on to? Is it still working and doing what I want it to do? What are the situations that I'm creating, really preventing or enabling? Is that what I want to prevent or enable? What kind of change can take place? What different decisions can be made? Yeah. So those are the things I'm thinking about in there. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share one more here. This is to introduce um, the idea of a physical uh, conversation, which we eventually used in the disagreement project. This is a project called Understand, which was uh, created with students, um, with young dance makers in New York City, and also with some students from Smith College. And it's looking at racism. And we, I started it because I was noticing, I was, had, was involved in conversations around racism and noticing how difficult it is for people to talk about. And, and, the, and how strong the idea is that we can't understand each other's experience and that it's actually dangerous to try. And I saw how, I don't know if that's true or not, but I saw how that made it even more difficult for people to, to try to have conversations. So I started thinking about how what dancers practice every day really is to move toward the ideas of others, to move toward the physicality and the thinking. And that this practice is something that really makes dancers mobile and I started thinking about um, what would it look like to make a mechanism that would help people do that when they're thinking about racism. So what we came up with is, was this physical interview. So here you can see an image. The person sitting is looking at a question on the wall and they're answering with simple physical gestures. The person opposite them can't see the question, but they're just taking on the physicality. So they're receiving a visceral sense of the person and the person standing behind sees the question and takes the physicality of the first person on. So it's this circular, um, this circular pathway of information about somebody's experience. So in the Understand project, this is in California, um, there's two long lines where people are engaging in this and they rotate through the positions. So everyone has is part of every position. I'm not going to get too much into this project, but here you can see them and around the outside people are having conversations um, on the ex their experience of the impact of cultural and racial identity in their lives. And then here they are walking. Here's the same project in Germany. 
And the other part of this is that there are two lines in space and here people are tapping on their legs to answer questions that look at how racism shows up really concretely in our lives around food insecurity, access to health insurance, levels of incarceration, the ability to own your own home, whether children are physically punished in school. And we, we ended up with this, this audio version because we found that these questions were very confronting for people. People wanted to get the information out, but they also felt put on the spot. And we found if we translated it into sound, it had a way to make, it, make its way into the space without putting people on the spot in a way that was too uncomfortable. So in this project here, you can see all the parts at once. The people in the middle are doing the physical interview, the people on the side are tapping, and then there's people walking. So we made here decisions about pathways, about the motion of the individual body, the definition of terms. We handed that over to the participants and we used a lot of configuration, a lot of repetition. So um, that project has, has been in a number of places now. It's been in, it was down at Smith College in Los Angeles, in Berlin and in London. And then the physical interview migrated to the disagreement project. Um, and the disagreement project is a different kind of project than I had done before. So it's not an event, but instead it's a shared practice. And out of that shared practice, there's been some things, artifacts, let's say that emerged. And I started the project because I was noticing how I was really dehumanizing people who were on the other side of the political um, line from me in the United States. And I was noticing how strong that was, like I really was dehumanizing them in spite of every effort that I made. So I thought, okay, oh my God, what would it be like to build some different kind of practice here? And how could I create a community that could help me do that? So starting from the observation that our attention in conflict is usually on the gestures of attack and defense, we stick with it, we keep repeating it. And then we oriented the project differently. So orienting the attention away from arguing about positions and beliefs to try to instead to get a sense of the people themselves. So focusing on a broader spectrum of human gesture. And the goal there is to try to expand our sense of what matters when we're in conflict. Often we really narrow it down to, you know, position to open it up to think, OK, what else matters here? So I invited nine artists from around the world to work with me on the project. Um, Two of them are here today. Um, so Jumana Al-Rafai from Kuwait. Nur Barake from Syria. She lives in Austria now. Isaac Blake, UK Romani Gypsy, lives in, in Wales. Mayra Hernandez from Boston. Ani Javian, who we have with us here today. Jackie Niamond from Kenya. Val, who we have today. Chakivas Thomason from South Carolina. And Meng Fang Wang from China and Japan. So here we are working on Zoom during the pandemic. <laughs> Some of these people I haven't had a chance to see yet. Um, okay, so So the process that we went through included, and in a second, I'm going to ask Anne, Annie and Val to talk about their experience. The process included each of us choosing a topic, so trying to choose a topic that there was adversarial. And those ranged from talking about abortion to talking about punishing children or use of the internet or um, critical race theory, all of those kind of things. And then going through a process of trying to recognize our own habits in difficult conversations and practice a willingness to really listen, to share experience rather than just argue, and to maintain, build and maintain like a really robust curiosity throughout the process. And then we each went out and found people that we agreed with and disagreed with on those topics. And we exchanged with them first through uh, spoken conversations where we spent about 25 minutes, usually sometimes much longer, sometimes shorter. Um, looking at how our experiences have shaped our beliefs on that topic, and then through these physical conversations where people responded to questions using only physical gestures. 
So the physical conversation always took place after the spoken. So a kind of distillation of attention. We went from position to history, to beliefs, to complexities, and then down to the physical, so how life feels. So here are, um, here are the questions that we used in the spoken. How have your personal experiences or the stories of others impacted how you think about this topic? Each person would have a chance to speak. It, the setup was that one person speaks, the other person has a chance to just listen. So it wasn't a regular back and forth, but a really concerted effort to speak and listen on the level of experience. And then are there underlying values or ethical beliefs that are connected to this topic for you? And are there gray areas or points of complexity that you notice when thinking about this topic? So here, here are the people who ended up taking place. It's 47 people from 11 countries. And these are images of them in their, um, in their physical interviews. So I thought we could try the physical interview if you're up for it. So if you could um, turn your videos back on. Okay. So I'm going to offer you um, a question and invite you to answer uh, in just really simple physical ways. It's where this is, doesn't have to be interpretive dance or anything like that. It's really just where you notice things in your body. Um, the first question we just answer by tapping on your legs to make sound. How many years have you been alive? Okay. Okay. And when you feel joy, where might you feel it in your body? Thank you. When you feel sorrow, sadness, where might you feel it in your body? Yeah. Where might you feel loneliness in your body? When you strongly disagree with someone, where might you notice emotion in your body? When you feel really at ease with someone, where do you notice that ease in your body? Thank you. Where, where might you first feel emotion when you're walking in an unfamiliar neighborhood at night? Hmm. How might you breathe when you feel like you belong? Where might you feel rejection in your body? Where might you feel trust? What's the rhythm of your heartbeat right now? You'd show it in some way. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So that's a that's a very short version of a of a longer interview. Um, I want to make sure we get to talking to Val and Ani here. Let me just show uh, what this ended up with. 
one second. So the, the physical interviews were filmed and then the gestures, these people were transcribed into written and spoken languages. So they created these choreographic portraits of experience that can be then fleshed out by people's listeners and viewers minds. So these take the form of audio recordings, video installations, printed images, and also the practices moving out to other groups. So the goal of the, the artifacts that are coming out of this are to serve as a break in what is often our habitual focus on opinions and judgments and categorization, and trying to reorient for a moment to this level of how life feels, to get a visceral sense of other people and their experience. Um, so these have different forms. They can be um, audio like this. Esteban, Welsh Carly, in a blue shirt, seated in front of a gray wall, tilts his head to the right, closing his eyes, and places his right hand on his forehead and his left hand on the center of his chest, then moves his left hand to his stomach and his right hand to cover his eyes. Or they can take the form of, one second. of these glimpses of images from the um, videos of the physical interviews. And then they also appear in a um, written way like this. So these white letters are projected onto walls in public spaces. Okay. All right. Now I would love to hear Val and Ani, if you could, um, Talk a bit about your experience in the project. It would be great. Whoever feels like jumping in there first. Val, I can go. Yeah, I can go. Um, so, uh, well, there, I was doing some reflection on the project this morning, thinking about this talk today. Um, and a few things came up for me um, that, that remain with me. Um, one is uh, throughout the physical, throughout the verbal interview, um, how uh, my empathy really expanded when listening to someone with whom I disagreed on my topic. And um, I think that came, that was a bit, that was surprising to me in the moment. Um, and it was something that I felt Im immediately, I felt gratitude for it, that there was sort of a real, a real opening of myself and we were uh, seated across from one another, um, similar in a way to how Dana had positioned us earlier. Um, but I, I felt that like that invisible line or the barrier that we didn't use particularly in this project, but that was sort of existent in a way because I was seated opposite someone with whom I disagreed, begin to shift and um, that border become more permeable. I'm also a dancer and I understand, I understand my life through movement and my body. And, um, I often, I often, um, I often feel like I know things in my body before I know things, uh, with words or language and, um, being able to witness folks who are not dancers or not practiced in, in body methods, um, gesture and and witness the the question and then the sort of like the dropping the dropping of the language mind intellectual response into their bodies to then gesture in the physical interview was uh, incredibly moving for me. One of one of the folks that I interviewed was my 80, 80 year old uh, godmother um, with whom I have no sort of like I've, I've never seen her move in these ways before. So that was that was um, really impactful. And, uh, and finally, there was a question um, in the, 
in the verbal interview um, that asked about what's at the heart of this matter. And I'm not getting those words. I might not be getting those words exactly right. Um, what's at the heart of this matter for you? And I can, I'm, I return to this question a lot. I've returned to this question a lot since we concluded the project. Um, as a way for me to, it, it sort of is a reminder for me um, that, that it, it, it's a reminder for me that, that all of the decisions I'm making are, um, are a result of all of my life's experiences and that all of this, all of these experiences have gotten me to where I am today to then be able to make these, um, these choices. And, uh, and I notice I, I'm thinking when I'm in conflict with other people, um, when I can pause and take that moment, how, how important that is and how I relate to the, and how I relate to others. Hi, um, thank you so much for the opportunity, Dana. Um, I too had a reflection this morning, um, just sort of like tracing back like my decisions and like why I chose the topic I chose was I chose a, a topic uh, around call out culture and cancel culture. Um, and, uh, and just, Coincidentally, the people that I uh, asked to be part of the project in my community um, uh, were also in conflict. Um, so I think uh, it was really interesting to like see this like like parallel like um, journey of like um, uh, suggest the suggestion of having people get in touch with their bodies and like touching and seeing themselves in their feelings or where they feel things uh, before they get too defended or too external, uh, having to like address their boundary or address the other person or address the person that they are um, in disagreement with, that they sort of are able to see themselves first uh, was something that I feel like um, uh, was really useful for me to notice. I'm a choreographer as well, so I am in rooms with people, and you know, like working with people is not easy. And and sometimes like um, having tools to just like letting people get in touch with themselves. Uh, where do you feel joy, or you know, in ways that they feel like, oh, I feel sad. Um, you know, we're moving our bodies too fast in the world. Sometimes you let your don't let yourself like totally feel things. Um, so like the other thing that like this project really taught me is like how you kind of like Dana has an amazing way of stacking a progression that reaches into something. Um, so you don't go from A to like P, like right away there's like a very considered and curated amount of like steps and time allowed and sensitivity and a deep like understanding on of how like bodies process like pain or discomfort or information or defendedness and it's very like you take it, you can really take it for granted if you just receive the information and do it yourself. But if you have to like ask another person to participate with you, you really notice like the ways that these, um, the structure was sort of created and it was created in like conversation with all of us that it's so uh, thoughtful. And I've really learned a lot from like the kind of like thoughtfulness from step to step. Yeah, that yeah, the process of talking all with you, all, we, we met for several months and we went through this long process. I also learned so much about um, how, like you're saying, Val, how do we how do we create roundnesses, let's say, in, in time that allow people to experience a thing without being overwhelmed and to still fold it back in. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, and the last thing is that like, it's really use it was really useful for me to understand the power of a container of time. So like, we will only do this for 15 minutes and whatever discomfort we were in, we would be released from that after that. So you just have to stick with it or stew in it for this amount of time. That was really useful, like as a tool for me to learn about. Yeah. I also remember after I was reviewing our conversations that when we kind of did wrap up conversations and all of us had this, had this realization like, wow, people believe what they do because of their experience. It's not because they're idiots, it's because they believe it based on what they've learned. And that for me was, was uh, seems obvious, but it was something that I really took away. Yeah. Yeah, do people have any questions for either for Ani or Val or me or? Thoughts about what we've been doing today? I have a question um, for everyone. Um, oftentimes there's this need to maybe critique the level of um, or how to craft this uh, level of force that is required um, in conflict transformation or nonviolence work. Um, and of course, I believe that nonviolence is something that can be sustained and does change through increments of time. But then there's always this um, point that maybe one who identifies as left or progressive or more open and available to our alternative ways of being with people um, when violence is happening um, constantly within your neighborhood, both in, you know, a, um, a interpersonal or a micro and macro. And I just wonder, based on your experiences, um, not for an answer, but maybe sort of like patterns that you see in terms that like help people realize that there is something alive and happening always and not to become disenchanted with the way that we are constantly confronted by violence in multiple directions. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons that I really focus on action and decisions, because I think that's the place where we can notice that things are not permanent, because they feel so permanent in a conflict. But the more we can unfold things and say, okay, let's look at all these different things that are impacting the situation. Let's look at what decisions are mine to make, what are others, and that that's a place where even when it feels like the persistence of violence is so overwhelming, that we can stay, okay, it's not a monolithic permanent state it's a series of choices and i think we for me i it's all about building power with people because that that's what this project was for me i reached out to these artists because i i realized i could not do it by myself i was like i tried and i'm a professional conflict engager and i was still like mm, with those people mm -hmm. um, so the more that we can really recognize decisions made the more we're able to make things more permeable it's my experience Val, wait, did, we, did you have something you're going to say? Um, I just want to, like, I live a block from George Floyd Square in Minneapolis, and that's where George Floyd was murdered. Like, the cup foods that he was murdered in front of was, was my convenience store. Um, and so I live in a neighborhood that's very defended and kind of, like, prickly uh, sometimes, actually a lot. <laughs> and um, we have, like, kind of a, at, like, adversarial relationship with the police uh, like you know like if our garage gets broken into we we don't call the police and I think there's just just general like distress and uh, uh, and uh, and I think that like when people do come to come up to the surface for air and they can see that um, that to stay in the present moment especially in the negotiation of conflict where um, you know, it, because it's a, it's a site, people are attracted to it because it's a site. And the, like people come and try and create drama so they get attention, you know? So like the, 
it's it's important to understand that like what are the larger forces that are flying around you and the people who are guardians of the site definitely understand that like to staying present in any moment and the out the like not getting attached to like the outcomes of what they want stating the outcomes but knowing that like every negotiation is a tiny step forward or backward and like not to get frustrated if you don't get anything you want. It's a long game, you know, like in this neighborhood um, uh, for a long time, like two years, like during the pandemic, it would be every night, some version of like gunshots and I would fall asleep to them. Um, so it's, it's pretty real, uh, like being in like a situation like that. Um, but also you kind of, as people, you like reach out like I'm more connected with my neighbors or the people that live around me than I would ever have been. So like, you know, there's like, like different ways to kind of like reach across there too. So I don't know if that helps or answers anything. Yeah. Hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? I have a question. Um, it seems I'm imagining this kind of activity is happening more among individual people who are more or less equal or, you know, should be equal in the space. And I'm just curious if you've done any of these um, with groups in which there's a very clear power imbalance. Um, and, and also kind of what conflict resolution looks like in those spaces. Mm, yeah. Um, just before, before we get to that, Ani, I just wanna check in because I know you have to jump off. Any, any thoughts that you have, last thoughts before you have to take off? Uh, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, to remember this because it's been a bit of time since we've been inside the project and um, and I'm, it's, it's brought up new ways that it's still uh, resonating and impacting my choices today. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here in the middle of your semester. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And yeah, so to so lead to your question about power imbalance, there's, there's almost never equal power. There's almost always power imbalances. And the, uh, for me, the idea that we can ever reach some kind of like um, level playing ground is not accurate. And so for me, it's really building up an, an aware, trying to constantly build an awareness about what are the issues that are impacting the different people involved in this conflict? How can we best uh, support people on all sides in a way that makes it more likely that we're moving toward a constructive outcome? Um, so I have worked with with a lot of groups where there's power imbalances and and it is always a negotiation for sure first of all to make sure that someone with power doesn't take over and then to make sure that i'm aware of what's going on so for me it's it's a constant building of awareness so in this project for example in the disagreement project the goal was to reach out to people who were in different much different situations maybe it was a different power situation or just different belief situation um, I'm really interested in how we internally practice. So whatever the other person decides to do, that we, that I'm interested in building the capacity to be present, to stay focused on the level of like what really matters, as opposed to getting stuck in this kind of defense attack mode. So in any situation, I find that's kind of at the heart of it. How do we get at the heart of what key people care about? How do we put that front and center on the table in a way that um, doesn't impact one party in a negative way. So, so that is that is the work for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Catalina. Uh, what about um, the the variation of intensities, like affect intensities? Because there's power imbalances, but as Valerie was speaking about the drama and drama calling attention, um, 
Have you in any of your projects addressed the variation of intensity, like emotional intensity? Yeah, so so what I'm curious about is that I, I'm okay. one artist, I'm one person, and I have one style. Um, I'm, I've been working with a lot of different people. Actually, there's a couple people here that I've worked with in courses where we look at, um, Jonathan and Anya were in, and Feline, um, <laughs> looking at, at how do you, what it means to use these kind of choreographic tools, let's say, to build things. So I'm, I'm curious about what other people will do. So how, how, how can we all be active in a way that for some people it's gonna make a lot of sense to do something that has a lot of dynamic in it. For other people, it's gonna make sense to create something that's more, you know, has a different level. So I, in my project so far, because I've been working in communities uh, that I don't know very well, and I'm working with local communities, so I'm, I'm really negotiating, like I don't wanna, I wanna make sure people show up. So I haven't done anything that's like, you know, hammery. Um, so I really try to create a situation that's open enough that people are willing to step into and that the physicality is not um, overwhelming for people who are not dancers. So, yeah, so I hope some people do make, you know, super dynamic <laughs> ones. Yeah. I just want to note that we're at 2.30. Um, I don't know, Val, if you have to jump off. Um, I'm, uh, I'm available, Annette, if people want to stay for a few minutes and have more questions, I'm available for a few more minutes. Uh, I don't know if you can or not, Annette, and then Val, Leia. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Val. Um, yeah, any other thoughts or questions people have, uh, either for Val or me, or thoughts about any of the models that we tried out there? I'm just looking through the chats here. Mm -hmm. What was your experience of the physical interview, a physical conversation? Oh, and Hannah Elise is also here that we worked that I worked with. <laughs> I would be curious to hear from Valerie also from you, Dana. What 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 did you notice in the people that you interviewed? Like now I heard you, Valerie, and then Annie also tell about your experience. And what did you notice in the people? Like what kind of feedback, what kind of response did you get uh, when approaching them with this physical interview? I'd be curious to hear about that especially the people you disagreed with. Yeah, I, for me, like the, the most common response was when it was over, it was like, that was really cool. Like it, in the, the in immediate first response, it was like, like relief, like somebody was something connected, something resonated, but there is no language or understanding of what that is yet. There was a kind of like curiosity about what they were feeling and where they were at. Mm -hmm. And that uh, throughout the time, something shifted in, something transitioned um, in whatever they were doing. Uh, for the person that I was uh, disagreeing with, there was a uh, like definite like um, more openness to like be able to meet a little bit I see what you were saying about the, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and just a short like sentence about like, um, and I was able to be like, I see how, you know, that your example of like trying to call out or tr cancel this person actually brought about like meaningful change for the community. I'm really gonna think on that. That really like resonated with me. Whereas, because I, I don't believe in cancel culture, but I, but they convinced me that like there is some good to be had from it and I could see that so mm -hmm. like for us there was some sort of meeting or like I can see where you're coming from mm -hmm. so, on the topic at least mm -hmm. so. yeah I had a similar experience and also in talking to the other artists people tended to have the experience that they had conversations they didn't think would be possible and the people who had this kind of like gratefulness for it, like, 
Oh, actually, that was that wasn't bad. That, I, I didn't think we'd be able to talk about that, but I, I understand you better now. And um, and I had, I mean, my own experience. I was kind of shocked by my own experience because I, you know, I work with this stuff all the time. But I got in that one conversation where I disagreed, and my heart was racing. I was like freaking out internally. <laughs> And so the practice was really powerful for me of of a, a sense of freedom, which was weird. I had this I realized that I was hanging on to what I thought this person should do. And I and the practice enabled me to let go in a way that I was not anticipating. And a lot of other people echoed that, that they um, they sensed in themselves like, oh, wow, I'm spending so much energy on, on trying to control what other people should think. So it was this kind of this break in our habit of, of this moment of being with people and just being willing to be with them in spite of the fact that we think that they're, you know, believe things that we don't believe to be true or whatever it was. Okay, thank you. I guess my like further big question is like how, how to apply this in when we work with bigger political groups or communities and we're not able to meet every person face to face. But um, yeah, maybe it's like a question no, that I throw in the room, may, may, unless you already have a wonderful. No, so, so that's why I started this project, because I mm. was on a political level just struggling and suffering and so angry and mm. and recognizing that in all of those situations, it always begins with this internal practice mm. and that if the internal practice is not conscious, we very quickly flip into polarizing and demonizing and mm -hmm. demonizing. And so I, you know, I, what I, I was listening to some people talk the other day from the, um, what's it called, the social action in Boston, talking about how these kind of interventions obviously are not changing the world, but they are creating a break where there's a different experience for a moment. And that we can practice that kind of a break internally in ourselves, even if we're not involved with the other people. And and just having a series of breaks kind of collectively expand to the point where more and more people have an experience of just not being ready to kill somebody, but take a step back and be like, okay, woo, that's hard to hear, but I'm gonna just practice for a second. Yeah. Trying to listen to what this person cares about. So I'm, I'm coming at it from the standpoint that, you know, and I've had a chance to work with actually a number of you here now, which is great. Like all of us, if we take that time to take a step back and listen, which doesn't mean that we give in or that we stop arguing about things, we stop like working toward what we think matters, but that we do it without violence uh, because noticing that the violence doesn't help. Yeah. Even though it feels like dynamic, it feels like we're doing something, it doesn't help ultimately. So that's what I think in that practice. I don't know, Val, what do you, what's your thought on that? I, I feel like when people get an opportunity to like um, be seen or fully express themselves and not have to tiptoe or to um, like massage themselves around other people that they're more willing to listen. It puts them in a better place to be listening or and be less offended because they feel already heard. Um, and um, I'm in currently in a situation actually where um, it's not me. It's like it's a situation if, if one of the spaces that I run here, I run a, a, a dance incubator um, where we had a yoga studio move in next door and suddenly we have to be all kinds of quiet because of their shavasana. Um, and so I was kind of like really like understanding, first of all, like this process really helped me like as Dana says like we feel like like we feel the things we feel and it's nobody's fault that we feel the things we feel right um and so being able to like I'm very like triggered by like people telling me or people in my community queer BIPOC people that you're too loud you're too much you're too this you're too that um and so like going into that situation and like calmly just trying to like lay it out for that person um 
was actually like one of the hardest things for me because I was I really needed to regulate like my heart was beating my breath was shallow I was really trying to hear that you know they're really trying they're just a startup they're just trying to run a business like really just trying to hear all that um but also like for me like especially in larger situations like I realized that I wasn't I wasn't the best person to advocate for myself and my community in that situation because I was unable to hold the other person's um, narrative. And if I can't hold that person's narrative, it's not possible to move forward. So I um, engaged an advocate, um, two advocates, um, and they have actually progressed these conversations much further than I would have been able to. But it came from a place where I knew that I needed to be able to allow them to like be get to a place where they're ready to hear me because like if you, two people meet and one person is talking and talking and talking at some point they're like well well actually what do you have to say because I've just talked at you for like a half an hour and then they're ready to listen to something um and I feel like like um I'm more ready now to let somebody like take space be open and listen first or like with with some like e equity around that so that I hopefully can be heard too and over time that might be better. Thank you. It's very illuminating. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so maybe that's a good spot to um, wrap up unless someone has some burning last question it's really it's been great to uh, talk with you all and i really appreciate your thoughtful uh, considerations and val it's, it's great to see you again and hear you again <laughs> um yeah thank you so much everybody and aneta and leah thank you for making this possible and matis too um i'm going to hand it back to aneta for a moment and then we'll wrap it up yeah, and I just want to thank you, Dana and and Val and also Ani um, for this really wonderful hour and a half. Um, I think I'm coming out of it a little changed somehow. I would, I would differently aware of my body, um, which always is a little bit behind, but I feel like, you know, taking away, being aware of that before you go into something can be actually uh, really interesting. Um, different perspective of a lot of situations. Um, and I'm also grateful that we were able to get such a um, inside view of the process of this, of this project. Um, we've been sort of hearing about it a lot and asking a lot of questions like, oh, when is it going to be finished, um, which is kind of what you do as a presenter. But I'm realizing now that this is really a project that had an organic process and really needed to, to sit and, and develop and you know, all these discussions that you've had and looking back at the pictures. Um, and it was really helpful and, and wonderful to see that um, and to experience that today and actually to get a little taste of what it was to be part of the project. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're definitely really looking forward to seeing where this goes um, and where we'll encounter it again. Um, and good luck with it actually. <laughs> so, and thank you all for coming. I'm so glad you, you came and participated and um, it was great to meet you all online and hopefully we will meet in person someday. Um, yeah, so. thanks so much. And just as someone just asked if there's more things happening, I do things um, intercontinentally online. If you, if you just go to my website, you can sign up my newsletter, you get news. And this project is kind of like starting to take new forms. It's we're going to go to Wales and do a, a tiny version of it with a smaller group. Um, well, actually, with the same size group, but we won't be video taping. We're just going to go through the same process and have the same process in the gypsy community, the Roma gypsy community. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, Val Minneapolis is interested in talking about something too. <laughs> yeah. I can totally come to Vancouver. Um, I do a lot of work online too. So we, this, it's not possible to do events online. Um, I've discovered in the pandemic and a lot of training also. 
And I really love to work with people because I think that's, you know, like started to come up before that we build power together, um, things that feel impossible. I think that nobody can tell us they're not possible until we actually try on a large level to shift our focus and, um, and do try things differently. So thank you so much for, for being here. Yeah. Today.